I think that uh, one of the reasons why guys write enormous symphonies and write uh, uh, four-and-a-half-hour opera librettos and scores is because, you know, I, I, I really do think that men generally, from the very time they are hatched, live more nervous lives than women. Now, I don't mean that men are more nervous than women. I, I, I would like to say there's a difference between the lives men lead and the way they are. But their, their lives themselves, the, the, the actual life itself is more nervous than women. I mean, from the very time a little kid is a, is a year and a half old and he's got to go out and start being a kid, you know, he's got, he's got to measure up to different things that a chick never has to measure up to. I mean, any, any guy who's listening to me out there knows just how it feels to be... You know, when the, when the kids are choosing up? Yeah, when the great chicken clawed chooser, working all the way to the top of the bat, picks the first guy that you know is always going to get picked, Amos, whatever his name is, a square-jawed, heavy-muscled kid, and they start picking, and then finally there's the dregs left, the culls. I don't know whether girls ever go through a thing like that. I have no idea. Uh, there, there is no... I think men are more direct about it. Kids, I, I, do girls choose up like that? Never really know. I don't think so. Men choose up all of their lives. They choose up right here at this crummy office. Every day on the 23rd floor, they're choosing up. Leaders up there, the great chicken clawed chooser. And the culls are down here, believe me. Well, it's the truth. I mean, and the cull knows he's a cull, I'll tell you. And, and many a chick out there is married to a cull and doesn't understand why he keeps coming home with all the martinis squirting out of the ears. You see, there are levelers, too, that culls use to make them believe that they are the chosen. Now, the, among the levelers, are, of course, are martinis. Martinis, ball teams you can yell and holler at. What do you think Mickey Mantle does for all the culls in this town every year? I'm serious about that, you know. And, 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 and all the guys that spend their nights sitting in front of television sets watching westerns. Now, there, there, there isn't a cull in the lot of the TV heroes, and you know that. I mean, these, you know, these guys, they never miss. Crying out loud. And, of course, the cull sits out there, and he doesn't identify with the culls that you see in the background in the TV western. You know, the guys that are hiding in the windows in the upper stories? that gets shot real quick, you know, and he goes down, he falls down the roof, and his rifle lands on the street. That's the cull, you know. He doesn't identify with that guy. Oh, no. He identifies with the two chosen. Now, there are chosen good guys and chosen bad guys. Believe me, in Dillinger's gang, everybody in the gang knew who was the boss. Now, it's quite evident that among, among the bad guys, there are, there are the chosen. There are chosen crumbs. That's true. And so when these two guys are walking down that, that street, that, that hot, dusty street of Laredo, one guy in a white hat, another guy in a black hat, they're both chosen. Now, you can take your pick as to whom you're going to identify with, but you're going with the winner, no matter which way you go. When you see that mob careening down the street through Chicago, you know, when Dillinger's there... You see the Dillinger story on Naked City or something, and you see that mob roaring down the street. You never identify with the little fat thug in the back seat with the pimples who gets drilled the first five minutes. You never identify with that guy. He's one of the culls, you know. All right. And men have this problem. Women don't have the problem. Of course, women are uh, immediately, I'm going to get uh, swamped with letters from the, Oh, Mr. Shepard, you do not know. You don't understand what I'm talking about. That The men j really do choose up. It's men who play the gigantic contact sports, for example. Now, this is a symbolic choosing up, but let me tell you, it's awful real when you ain't chosen. And if you are chosen, you're sent out to right field, deep right field, where they haven't hit a fly ball in two years. And your only known function is to chase fouls into the weeds. Now, really, you know you're chosen. The kid starts out at the age of five that way. This is a born martini soak. By the time this guy's 48, he is squishing. Believe me, he's living on a solid diet of carbohydrates laced with occasional olives. And once in a while, an anchovy that comes on a cracker, the built Mart bar. This is true. You know, it starts out that way. It's a nervous life. It's a nervous thing. 
For example, I don't know of any chick who spent the formative years of her life hitchhiking. Now, this is a, this is a thing, you know. You stand out there with your thumb out, and shoo, past they go. Thumb comes out. I, almost every male type I know has at one time or another hitchhiked, who has really stuck his thumb out and stood by the side of the road, the great road of America. Stood by that great highway of life. That no, this way over here. That let's look at a little, little dramatic here. That that great highway of existence. That stood there with an eternal thumb of hope extended outward. Oh, please, please, please choose me. Phew. Wow. There it goes. Come on, Walt. There it's the way. There it goes again. Right past. Well. I, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, well, I, I have to. No, you have to. You have to level. No, no. Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Even among men, of course, there are guys that are born right there. They come right. They're, they're popped right out into the world with silver spoons sticking out of their ears. I mean, they they know that. Of course, they're listening to me, and they probably think I'm a nut. What is this nut? They don't know what it's like. Well, let me tell you something about hitchhiking, which uh, I think is part of a male world. Now, if, if you're a woman, now, many a woman will occasionally do that as funsville. You know, the famous, the cutie pie movies that show up on the late movies, you know, when once in a while Claudette Colbert will, will get out there by the highway and lift her skirt and hiding behind the bushes is, is Clark Gable. Well, that's, you know, that's movie hitchhiking. These guys, you know, live their lives in, in, in air-conditioned Cadillacs. That's funsville. Well, let me tell you about hitchhiking. When, when I, I'm this kid, see, and I'm living about five miles from the school where I was at that time festering. Well, there were a lot of other kids living in the neighborhood, see, who also lived five miles from the school. Now, we had our choice. We could ride the bus, which cost us roughly a nickel apiece per ride, with the bus tickets that the bus company sold to the schools on a special discount rate. Or we could take the five cents per each way, which made a total of 10 cents for the round trip, and we could palm it. Because the only, the, only, the only genuine thing we had to fulfill, the only genuine responsibility we had, was to get to Miss Snyder in time in room 220. Okay, you got it. Well, there was an option, a local option in my house. Get there. That was the option that I was given. Now, every day I would be slipped a dime. Now, I would then, i, I got to get there, see? But there are other ways to get there other than the bus, you know. Remember, it's five miles. There's no walkingsville there. I mean, you're not going to walk. Not for five miles through stick and stone and bush and prairie and whistling, howling blizzard and all that. So there was a road, one main road that went to this place where we were going to school. Went to, went to school. One, one, one big highway went that way. And <laughs> on that highway, there were cars, theoretically. You'd be surprised how spotty traffic is when you really need it. You, 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 so it's amazing. You know, you, you just think it's a steady flow. So, oh, no, no, no. I learned a lot about the vagaries of life. Vagaries? So I'm out there hitchhiking. Every morning I am hitchhiking for four solid years in high school. Every morning! Remember that! And in that four years I learned... It was probably one of the most formative things that I did, really. It, it, it formed... First of all, I recognized... The Russian roulette aspect of existence itself. I mean, you know, you've got to be there at 8.15. It is now 8.05. And no action. Nothing has shaken. And you're out there with nothing between you and disaster and Mr. Rupp and about five unbelievably snotty notes that he would write. You are left there between that and disaster, nothing but your thumb. And the honest, simple goodwill and beautiful milk of human kindness of your fellow creature on this fair globe. Oh, yes. Yes. One learns that one's fellow creature, one's fellow jot in the great, great, vast, flowing ebb and sea of life, that in the end we are but tiny rafts bobbing like corks upon the Sargasso Sea of ineptitude. <laughs> well, so every day, you know, I'm out. And I, it got exciting. See, I don't know whether women's lives are ever as exciting as men. Really, it's true. Now, because of that Russian roulette aspect of it, every day, I'll bet there are eight 
85 million guys in this country, I'll bet right now within, 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 if I were to put a pin right down here at 1440 Broadway and draw a line, and just, just extend a string out, say about, uh, oh, I'd say 10 miles, Walt, from this point right here, a string, you know, and just draw a great big arc, you know, <laughs> south, north, all around there, out to sea, I bet we would catch at least one and a half million guys of which every day, as they get up, as they, as they gallop their toast, as they slug down their orange juice, and as they get into their car, head towards the George Washington Bridge, one and a half million guys do not know whether or not they are heading into the lion's den and total annihilation, or perhaps on the other side of the coin, paradise itself. Literally, I mean that. In other words, they don't know whether they they don't know whether they're coming or going right the minute they get into their car. Now they all pretend they do, and a lot of guys will give you will give you all the jazz, you know, of the fast shifters down there on Lower Broadway. But don't you don't you get taken in by it? A lot of guys would like to believe that they know what's going to happen, and and but they're never really surprised when the buzzer buzzes. And the, the cartridge came up, the chamber came up this time loaded. Sitting there at the desk with his coffee cup in front of him, spinning that chamber. Every day, every day, and one day it comes up with the loaded one. Not really, you know, this is the truth. And, and, and women don't understand quite this problem. Now, it's true, many a woman gets canned. I'm not arguing that. But when she's canned, it's a different story. First of all, she gets sympathy generally from those around her. When a man is canned, he is shunned as though he is a leper. L-E-P-E-R. Right? And there is a, a, a kind of a, a little wave of self-congratulation that goes among the boys when one of their confreres is dropped down the chute. Oh, yeah. Well, they missed me this time. <laughs> well, let's see. They won't be canning another one until... Uh, quick glance at the watch. And well, let's see, we've got till four o'clock before another one goes down the hatch. And George, whew, that was a near miss. He's sitting in his little cockle shell, still rocking from the wake of the of the shot as it whistled past him. Well, now, uh, it's a very interesting problem, you see. So so boys start out, oh, oh speaking, of pro this is WORAM with FM New Yorky, and uh, we'll be here until the scores come back. They're readying more scores there in the next room. There's a big thing about scores. You know, I, I do believe, though, that men, in a lot of ways, uh, that men, I'll tell you one, one, here's an example. When you hitchhike, or when you are a male type and you are living the nervous life of the male, you see, women, women have a genuine function in life. Whether or not they want a kid, uh, you know, they want to make a big thing. Oh, no, true. They, they'll, they'll, they'll try like the devil to pretend they don't, that actually they're just men who got shortchanged. Forget it. Uh, <laughs> serious, you know. The, 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 the hardly uh, hardly a, a lady-type magazine issue goes by, but what one of them doesn't say, yes, a woman's way and a man's world is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Written by this hard, uh, you can see this square-jawed chick with a thin Van Dyke uh, writing this thing. And, and she, she's trying to prove that she really is a man underneath it all and that all the men are rotten for not, for not admitting it and pinching her on the way to the water cooler every couple of hours there, what happens. But the thing that, the thing that is... And you cannot you cannot get around it. Is is the man has a secret recognition of the fact that he really his role in life as we get more and more towards a welfare state, which is I might point out not the product of a democratic liberal coalition sneaky thing going on in Congress, but is the natural result of the end of the industrial revolution. This is the way it is. This is the way it'll always be. Uh, as 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 gradually this thing builds up the man feels that he doesn't have any actual function. That it would be very difficult for a lady left with her three kids today to starve. Really, it would be a very difficult thing. And so the man secretly knows this. Whereas the woman really, really, she really does have a function. She has a genuine, she is a woman. She has a function. 
uh, and, and it, is, it can't be circumvented, absolutely cannot be circumvented. Uh, whereas men, as any good medical doctor will tell you, can easily be circumvented these days in many ways. But the la no, the woman absolutely cannot. They have not yet come around to that. They will probably. But at this point in history, no. Yet. So there it is. So there it is. A little secret thing going all the time. The guy knows this is there, see? Well, so as he, as he lives this life, as, as, he, as he lives through this great industrial revolution thing till finally today when it's totally automated. As a matter of fact, I, I, I received a card, listen to this one, from the Metropolitan Chapter. Uh, the Metropolitan New York Chapter invites you to a meeting, and this is the chapter, apparently, of uh, big-time engineers, the New York Academy of Sciences, as a matter of fact. It was held Wednesday, March 13th, and Dr. Michael... Lezodek, National Manager of Operations Research, Arthur Young and Company. What did he discuss? Optimum utilization of human beings in complex systems. Whew. Good gracious. <laughs> Almost said something that really counted that time. I read, I read again. Optimum utilization of human beings in complex systems. Well, when a guy's working in an outfit that's studying that kind of stuff, he knows where he stands. In fact, he stands roughly about, oh, I'd say a little to the left and perhaps a little below in rank of a fairly complex bank of printed circuitry with the addition of perhaps 14 to 15 transistors. That's true. Seriously. We are running into that. What do you think the major problem is today with... Nobody's really touched this thing, the typographer's union. Nobody really will touch that. They wonder why these guys are fighting so hard. <laughs> and I'm not pro or anything in this thing. I know it's unfortunate. I'm happy I haven't got a newspaper. But the problem is one, really, of basic survival in the end. But there are certain systems which, uh, see, the artist never really quite understands this because the artist is never really automated. I'm not so sure, you know, whether, whether Jackson Pollock could have understood the problem of the guys working down in the, in the open hearth. I'm not quite sure of this. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure that Norman Mailer will understand it, because the artist is the indispensable man. And yet he constantly writes about the disposable man. And yet he doesn't write with the knowledge of the disposable man himself. One of the great problems today. You know, that, that, uh, that brings up another point of... Uh, of everybody's concern today for everybody else, uh, and hardly any concern yet for his own basic morality. But that's, that, that's just another program. However, uh, man, you see, himself, I'm talking about men, not, not, not mankind, but men. They live, live a very, very uh, nervous kind of life because of this. Uh, you, you rarely see the same look in the eye of a woman that you see in the look in the eye of a scared account executive. It's just another kind of fear. Because when a, when a woman is fired, she's just fired. When a man is fired, he loses his identity in the entire community. A man out of work is very different from a woman out of work. Even if the man is a millionaire, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of a bum if he's not working. People look down on him. And, and especially when a, when a man hits a certain age, oh boy. Boy, then it gets really not. It gets worse than any bullfight, you know, that ever could possibly be. It's it's a it's a real it's it's a it's a real thing going, you know. It's it's a real wild thing going. But nevertheless, I I remember as a hitchhiker, and I think that that as a as kind of a an adjunct to education, I suspect that it would be good to send the average kid in his teenage out teenage world out for about a year and a half of good brisk survival hitchhiking. Now, when I say survival hitchhiking, I don't mean fun hitchhiking, like the hitchhiking to the big Yale game, something like that, just for kicks, you know, and talking about it for weeks afterwards. Well, I'm talking about survival hitchhiking. See, the only way I could get money, I'll have to point out this, that at that point in life, this was the depression, the real depression, and the only way I could get any money as a kid was that five cents each way. That, that was my allowance. I could, I could either blow it on the bus... Or hitchhike. So I was able to knock down a good, you know, 10 cents a day. That was a good 50 cents a week if I could hitchhike. And it was Russian roulette. 
because there was something about chickening out. If if nine of us got up on the corner, you know, we're all hitchhiking, and it was all strictly according to seniority, Russ. If you got there first, you were automatically accorded the first ride, and we were all strung out. So, guys, hitchhiking, if a car stops at the end of the line, you get the ride. It was done by... We had absolute morality codes worked out, and, and they worked, you see. The, now, of course, it wouldn't work that way, I'm sure, because the, the morality codes today relate to other people. In other words, uh, a cartoonist can be very angry about the integration problem if he lives in, say, uh, uh, in New York, and he gets very mad about what's going on in Mobile, Alabama. In short, he's highly moral these days about everybody else, whereas at the same time, he has just left his fourth wife and is making the scene with a secretary on the third floor. Well, so, in short, his morality is a, is a, is a varying, varying morality. What people like to say is that I want to preserve my freedom, but I want to regulate other people's attitudes. That's a very interesting problem. Well, uh, so, so as, we, as we get closer to it, you know, you get, you get into the hitchhiking world, and so we had a definite setup, you see. So you're standing on the line there. There were nine kids, we'll say, showing up. And there were regulars. <laughs> and once in a while, see, there were all kids exactly like me. They were all, and nobody was poor. Don't, don't everybody feel sorry and say, oh, you know, they were poor. No, were, nobody was poor. It was just, they don't, they don't hand out allowances in mill towns, that's all. Even if the guy's making the scene, if he's, he doesn't hand out an allowance, it's just not done. So there was no allowance, and all you got was the ten cents a day on the bus. So every morning you'd arrive. It was like fishing. Really, it was like fishing. You would arrive about 15, 20 minutes before the bus was supposed to show up. You see, you had that choice. It was like playing the scene. And then when the bus would come, you really had to make your choice. It was the moment of no return. You know the point of no return in, in the aircraft parlance? When that bus went down the street and you left it go by, it was, you just better get a ride, Dad. Or it was you and Rupp. That's all. You were going in over the horns. Well, so you develop, you develop an attitude which most kids apparently today don't ever develop. That is an attitude of danger. Because it was, by the way, very dangerous to be late in this school. Apparently it's not quite the same now, but it was very dangerous. Like if, if you were late twice, you were dropped from any extracurricular activities. And like I was on the football team, so I was playing with big stuff. I mean, big stuff for me, you know, a couple of times late and forget it, Ted. You ain't going out to practice. That's the end of it. You just sit in there and twiddle. Well, so every morning we would arrive. It's a very exciting time. And the, the sun would be shining. And there were signs that you, you could read. If you got up there 15 minutes ahead of time, it was a good day. For some reason or other, people's attitudes towards other people go in waves. I learned this at the age of 10 or 15, hitchhiking. In short, on certain days, every car that comes by the guy stops to pick you up. There's just something in the air. Every car comes by. On other days, there could be there could be a thousand cars go past in the line and you get nothing but the stony look. And not only the stony look, but then they barrel it past you. You just see they step on it when they and they look out. Or they or when they, wah, wah, they honk at you. So it, and, and it's not just one or two guys, it's the whole crowd. And then you get scared right away. As soon as you get out there and you get that from one guy, you know you're going to get it from a lot of other guys right away. And so one of the great, <laughs> one of the great, yeah, you, you, you learn about real life, you know, out there hitchhiking. So one of the great feelings was to come up there at my regular time and find no kids, maybe one or two kids. That means they're biting good today. Great, you know, there's been real business out there. So I come up and I say, how's it going, Flick? He says, oh, Swartz got, Swartz got a Chrysler. Yeah. How about Bolas? Oh, I bought us a Hudson for all that clunker. But they're all gone. You see, they're all gone. They're all gone. And so you feel great. You know, you stand out there, you stick your thumb out, you know right away they're biting. Pow! The next thing you know, along comes a, a Packard, and you're in, and that's it. You feel, you know it. But then there are other times when you'd see the mob. You'd get out there, and there's a, a, the mob is waiting, and they've got that worried look, that scared look of a lot of account executives just before leader calls the big meeting, the extraordinary meeting at which Mr. O'Neill is going to speak. You know, there's a funny look around the eyes. And there have been some strange men that they've seen going in and out of leader's office during the week, guys carrying briefcases. And, you know, there's a funny look. Well, that's the, the kids get that feeling. Uh-oh. 
and just sort of string out, you know, rest string out. Everybody, everybody has this unspoken pact that if, if one car stops, we're going to nine of us get in. Uh, just all of us are going to pile in like mad. We used to try that until we'd pack the cars and you know, the guys would load up. And once in a while, one, one character would come along. Occasionally, a real great character would come along, and he would try to pick up everybody on the whole road in his Model A. And there'd be 36 kids in the Model A, all screaming and hollering, feet sticking out of the back, you know, and bumping their heads on the floor and yelling. And the whole, the whole pack would get on the street. But we used to wait, you see. And you're waiting, you're waiting. And, and uh, oh, you, you, you learn, you, you, you can, I don't know what it is, you can even, as you stand on the street and look at a car coming, it's the way the man sits, it's the way the light hits the windshield, it's, it's even the way the sound the tires make. You know whether this is a good guy coming. I can't express it. You just know it. Even to this very day, you know, when I'm standing, walking along, as I'm waiting for a light, I can see crumbs go past. I can see good guys. I can just, once in a while, I feel the itch. You know, when I see great crowds of traffic, you just start hitchhiking at general principles. And it's just, you, you hate to see all this good stuff going by. So I remember one morning, it's one of the times when, when I learned about the bull, and I learned about... Well, it's the nervous thing. I'm sure women never have this day because they don't live this kind of life. They just don't hitchhike. They don't plunge themselves into the breach like men. I don't know of many women who have gone tearing up, uh, just tearing up the beach at Anzio. <laughs> you know, this is uh, you know, this, this is a man thing. As nutty as it is, there it is. They do it. You know, uh, it's there. It is. Now, uh, women will partake of sports, but I'm talking about the things that really count. Really count, uh, like, like that Anzio situation. That's not a sport. No matter whether you see Rip Torn and Van Johnson do it on the late movie or not, it's not a sport. That was, that's real blood, not ketchup, you know. That's a real thing there. In, in spite of the fact that long, that, that one of the most immoral mu uh, movies I've ever seen, uh, from my standpoint, is The Longest Day, because they reduced uh, the, uh, the, the, really did, they reduced it to a kind of gigantic, Red Buttons, John Wayne, not even a movie. They reduced it a kind of, to a kind of half-hour TV show, stretched out for four hours, you know, nothing but laughs all the way down the line. But nevertheless, well, yeah, you yeah, see that, a little laugh a minute. It's funny how many guys, but a lot of guys are wondering where they missed all those laughs when they were there, you know. Of course, you know, you don't always have the sense of humor of a John Wayne. He knows how to die. You know, <laughs> ordinary guys don't. They just get blown up, and they just splatter all over the side of a tank. Or something, you know. There's just no humor in it. It's not done right. Or your last words are, are, are often so bad compared to the last words in the movies. You know, they're much better the way they work it out there. But nevertheless, I'm hitchhiking one day, and this was one of those great scarifying episodes. And a guy comes along. I think he was driving. Yeah, I'm, I'm picturing the car now. I can see it. He was driving a Studebaker. He was driving a Studebaker model, which they don't make anymore, a Studebaker called the President. Did you ever hear of the Studebaker President? Well, are you... Oh, great, big, gutsy car. Oh, yeah, fantastic machine. A Studebaker... They even had... They had plans at that time. Of course, this was before the war, actually. So the, the term wasn't in such bad repute as it is now. But they had plans for a Studebaker dictator. Got big spikes sticking out of the hubcaps, you know, and great big pointed things in the front, and a little steel helmet riding up there on the top there for the radiator cap. And and this was a president. And the guy picked me up. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I had 15 minutes to get to school. I had already gone over the horns. And, you know, you, you, you grab. So this guy came along. He says, come on, get in, kid. Opens the door, this great big black shiny Studebaker president. And I hop in the front seat with the guy. And we start out. He throws the thing in first. And we took off, excuse the expression, lady, but like a bat out of hell. This guy throws this thing in first. And that was a powerful machine, I might point out. We go out and we go down the street. Barreling. Well, I, you know, I'm a kid, so I kind of dig this at first. And we are whistling. Now I figure I'm really in. I'm really not. I'm not going to have a rup session today. Well, we're whistling along along the highway. When this guy begins to sing, he begins to show signs of elation. 
Like, uh, how things at uh, high school, kid? How about it there? Hey, hey. And he reaches out and hits me on the muscle, you know. He's one of the boys. He wants to show that he... Pow, you know. Hi, how, how about it? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I went to Hammond High. Yes, sir. Hammond High. Is, uh, is H. McCullough still there? I says, yes. Yeah, hi, old bag. Hi, <laughs> George. Pow, on the muscle. Well, you know, nothing a high school kid hates more than to be talked to by an ex-high school kid about the high school. You know, it's a very, it's a real drag. So he's batting me on the elbow and uh, hitting me on that muscle. I can't help it. Uh, hey, you got a letter there, kid. Oh, yeah, pow, 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 bang. Well, he was the first guy I had ever seen up to that point outside of my family, my immediate family. The first guy I'd ever seen bagged at 8 o'clock in the morning. He is, yeah, he's tanked. And he's wearing a man suit. You know, it's not a worker suit. He's wearing a man suit, you know, a gray suit. And, and he's, he's an adult. Well, you don't holler, hey, you're bagged, Dad. Let me out. Especially when you only got about seven and a half minutes to get the ham and high. So the guy says to me, he says, hey, aren't you kind of late, kid? And he looks down at his watch, and I says, <laughs> I didn't want to encourage him, you see, at this point. He says, hey, now, the school start at 8.15? I say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just like when I was there. Is old H. McCullough still there, the old bag? Pow. Belts me on the elbow again. Keep, you know, a drunk keeps repeating the same thing over. Is H. McCullough still there, the old bag? <laughs> Hell on wheels, we're going to pow. He bop you on the elbow. Well, then he suddenly became a very concerned man. Like he was going to get me there on time now. And he floors this son of a gun. We take off. Well, we are whistling through the prairie like, well, I'd say probably 95 miles an hour. And I'm hanging on there. You know, I'm just looking out the front. Shoo. Well, we're, we're overtaking one, one Chrysler, one Plymouth after the other. He goes past him. And he's always saying, oh, son of a gun, all age for Well, hey, is old Rupp still there? And by now, I'm feeling, you know, it could be kind of nice to sit down for a good, quiet half hour yelling for Mr. Rupp. Compared to that, I'm really starting to sweat. Well, suddenly this guy goes out around to Plymouth. Wow! He goes around to Plymouth, and there's a car coming at us. Well, he double floors it, you know. He throws everything. Well, we're not going to make it. Oh, yo, 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 yo! And I'm holding out of the front of this thing. I'm just grabbing. Well, he he does one. He has only one choice: either he belts the Plymouth on his side, or he goes head on into this truck that's coming, or we go off the left into the woods. Well, we go up into the woods, just like that. He makes the decision. Well, there weren't actually woods there. There was a shoulder on the road. And on that shoulder, there was an interurban railroad track, you know, that ran right along there with the ties. We are going, gadung, 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 gadung. We are bouncing along the ties. And we are going the same direction as the interurban railroad. Gadung, 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 gadung. And the truck goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And then the clown can't get off. His wheels are hooked in there. Gadung, 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 gadung. Boom! I hear a tire go in the back. Woo, woo, woo. Shoo! We stop. Boy, and stuff is dripping and squirting. I can hear things hissing. Whew. He says, hey, kid, you're going to get late. You're going to get late. He says, hurry up. Help me out. We'll change the tire. He jumps out of the car and runs around, falls over the rail, hits his head on a tie, gets up, starts singing, opens the trunk, and starts throwing tire tools around. And I'm standing there, and the car is just like... And I hear from the distance, I hear the interurban train coming. Whoa! It's coming along. Oi, 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 oi. So I rush across the street, and I start hitchhiking. I'm hitchhiking, and one of the Plymouths that we had just passed comes along, says, What's on, kid? And I says, Quick, I, 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 I'm late for school. Get in, kid. I get in, and there's two other kids sitting in the back seat, and we go, and the guy is standing back there. He's still hanging onto the trunk. I'm like, hey, kid, girl, well, we'll get you there yet. And I can see that train coming, and I can see that Studebaker president standing there, and I can see that milk of human kindness flowing like a great deep sea all around me. I just beat Rupp by 35 seconds. Oh, oh, I sat in my room. Miss, Miss Snyder, the human pincushion up there in front never looked better. It was the first time I ever felt glad to see her, that little old rotten person. And I sat there and she just looked down glaring malevolently with her yellow eyes at me. She knew I'd made it again. And I knew I'd made it again. And you know, it's funny, like a drunk, you say, I'm going to swear off. This rotten little nickel, I say. I'm going to swear off. Never again. Never again. 
five and a half hours later after school, who do you think is standing there on US 41, this time going south? Five minutes later, I'm on the back of a big pipe truck. We're whistling through the corn trees. We're whistling through the... This is WOR Radio, your station for news.